Good afternoon, folks. Thanks for joining us. I hope everybody had a wonderful lunch and got to enjoy the laughing love bugs. I'm Jill Pollander. I'm the Vice President of Patient Services at Nord, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our panel, Rare in the Family, Family Planning and Decision Making. I expect you're gonna have lots of questions for our panelists, so you all have little cute little cards, and you can write questions on those cards. Uh, there'll be Nord staff collecting them, and then what we'll do is we'll answer as many questions as we can at the end. Now, since many rare diseases are genetic and diagnosed in childhood, parents often struggle with family planning decisions. Some rare conditions are associated with increased risk during pregnancy, during family planning, and may involve treatment that impact fertility. In this session, we'll explore the important medical, social, psychological, and financial considerations relevant to these difficult decisions, and they're very personal decisions. Moderating this session, we have Barbara Harrison, certified genetic counselor and assistant professor Department of Pediatrics at Howard University College of Medicine. Joining her on stage, we have Tiana Wolford, co-founder and chief executive officer of the Sickle Cell Reproductive Health Education Directive and person living with a rare disease. We have Beth Papanastasio, a rare mom and fierce advocate. And we have Dr. Al Friedman, psychologist, at Friedman Counseling Association and Bereaved Rare Caregiver. So with that, I'll turn it over to our panel. You're in for a treat. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. I know we just had our laughter yoga session, so we should all be you know, ready for a conversation. So good afternoon, I'll say it again. I didn't get a response. <laughs> All right, hope y'all are out there. All right, so um, it is certainly my pleasure to be here this afternoon to share this um, discussion with you. Um, so as we know, um, many families that are affected by rare disease, whether it's having the condition yourselves or having a child with that condition, um, can really take you on a journey that you didn't imagine. And it affects so many aspects of our lives. So today, we specifically are going to explore issues around family planning and having children. And we're joined by three individuals here who have really traversed this road. And some are still on their journey, uh, but have traversed that road and are willing to share their stories in hopes that it might provide insight and let others know that they are not alone as they navigate these decisions. Now I want to pause and really acknowledge that these three are allowing themselves to be vulnerable, to talk about a topic that some may consider taboo and can certainly be charged in many ways. They are being brave to share this very personal aspect of their lives and they should be commended. I'm sure I don't have to say that we should treat them with respect and understanding that every person's journey is their own and should not be judged. So families affected with rare disease can face a multitude of feelings and decisions when it comes to family planning. Various developments in assisted reproductive technology has afforded us options such as using donor sperm, donor eggs, uh, donor embryos, which allows some influence over the genetic information that we pass on to our children. And in many ways has provided a pathway for those affected by rare disease who want to lessen their chances of passing the condition. But these options are not easy for everyone to, to access, not only financially, but we also have to take into account the personal and emotional toll that it can take on a person or couple because those can be quite significant. Further, the technologies themselves are not perfect and may place individuals or families in a position of making difficult decisions, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. And not only is the process of getting pregnant wrought with a myriad of issues, but the whole idea of having children may be overwhelming when a person has a rare disease or has a child with a rare disease or children with rare disease. Some conditions are associated with infertility or the options 
before treatment or cure may impact one's reproductive choices. For parents of a child with rare disease, plans for a large family, or even having one other child may be halted or reconsidered as they are investing energy and finances to meet the needs of their child with rare disease. So let's get into this conversation with, by meeting our panelists. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and their relationship to our topic today. And we'll start with Beth. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Beth Papanastasio, and um, seven years ago, my daughter was born with a rare genetic disorder. Um, once we learned that every pregnancy after would have a 25% chance of her uh, of that child having the same condition, we decided to um, go through IVF with genetic testing, and we started that journey about a year after my daughter Bella was born. Um, I've been through many ups and downs in that process. Um, actually, still here seven years later, still um, in the process now, and has not been as we had hoped. Um, Bella was a natural pregnancy, very easy to get pregnant with her. Thought, hey, we'll just get some healthy embryos and you know we'll be able to have this big family like we wanted and that is just not what happened so um i did have one other daughter you see in the picture there that's lily so um lily's four now and they're the joys of, of my life and um thank god for both of them um but it has been challenging so um I'm just here to share my experience with the thoughts that we had going through this process and, you know, the process itself and kind of the way to think through it, maneuver through it, and then certainly um, here for questions or follow-up emails um, afterwards. Go ahead. Al. Good afternoon. I think many of you may already know who I am from this morning session, but again, I'm Al Friedman. My relationship with this topic began in 1995 when our baby Jack was diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy and given a year to live. And we were educated on the fact that spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA, was a recessive gene disorder, and there was a one out of four chance that any future uh, baby that Jack's mom and I would have would also be affected by the same disease. So we were faced with the great challenge of how to take care of Jack and all of the medical challenges that he would face uh, and the life that was expected to be short at the time. And as I mentioned this morning, we were really, really lucky to have him for 26 years and not one. Um, but at the time, we were faced with the challenge of how to lose a child, and then how to expand our family. And it was uh, a long time ago, and the technology was just being developed for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for spinal muscular atrophy. So we explored that. I'll talk about that more a little bit later. We were exhibit A with the National Institutes of Health here in Washington to do that research. And then when that uh, proved unsuccessful for us, we turned to adoption and adopted baby Kara, who came from Korea when Jack was five and who spent some of her childhood riding on the back of his wheelchair. And she's now uh, 23. Um, and as a professional psychologist, I now uh, have these conversations um, more than occasionally with families, uh, with newly diagnosed kids and, and families like ours who face these types of challenges um, all these years later. I'm honored to be here. Tiana. Hi, everyone. I am Tiana Wolfert. I'm 31 years old, and I was born with sickle cell genotype SS. Um, so basically, uh, growing up, I did relatively well with sickle cell, um, diagnosed at birth, and was maybe hospitalized like once or twice a year. And then when I hit puberty around 15, 
that's when things kind of spiraled out of control. So by the time I was 16, I had had both of my hips replaced. I had been in liver failure, all of that. Um, and, you know, after high school, I was watching all of my peers graduate and go off to college, but that just wasn't realistic for me. Like, my body was constantly failing me, and I was in the hospital, like, every two weeks. So um, long story short, my hematologist approached me about doing a bone marrow transplant, and I was on the Be The Match registry for about a year, didn't have a donor, um, and kind of let that idea of being cured go. But then um, a couple of years later, it was actually my mother. She's a nurse, and she was teaching, and it was one of her students. They were like, well, there's this newer research where you could be your daughter's donor. They're doing half match transplants. And so I did a little bit of research and knew that there was chemotherapy and radiation involved. But I definitely just felt so defeated, and, like, I didn't want to continue to live my life with sickle cell. So my initial consult, I told the doctor, I was like, look, I know I could die. I know there's a risk for cancer, all that stuff. The only thing I care about is my fertility. I've always wanted a lot of children. And, um, you know, the doctor, he was like, well, with all the complications you've already had, you're probably already infertile from sickle cell and just didn't know it. And I was 19 at the time, and that was my first time hearing that there could be any type of correlation between sickle cell and fertility. Um, so I went home and I did a Google search looking for education on fertility preservation. And once I saw the cost, I started looking into financial resources. And basically everything that I saw, um, I saw like foundations that would give grants for egg freezing if you had a diagnosis of cancer. And I did not have cancer, but I was getting chemo and radiation, so I thought I could still, you know, find a foundation that would make an exception but they did not. So I kind of reconciled, like, it was a fair trade-off. If I'm going to be cured, I can give up that dream of biological children. I'll just adopt. Um, but what happened was I rejected my transplant. So at age 31, I am infertile, dealing with the fallout of my bone marrow being messed up from the chemotherapy exposure and still have sickle cell. But there is another side to it. Um, I actually, a couple of years ago, started SC Red, the Sickle Cell Reproductive Health Education Directive, which is the first and only sickle cell organization in the entire world to have a mission around reproductive, sexual, and maternal health. So as Barbara said, these conversations can be kind of taboo and stigmatized, so I'm really glad for the opportunity to be here. All right, thank you so much. Um, so... Beth, um, you mentioned that you went through IVF and eventually had a second child. Um, can you talk a bit about what you experienced during that process? Did things, didn't sound like things went as expected? No, they didn't. Um, so like I mentioned, we got Bella's diagnosis and we thought, okay, well, there's no way we're going to take this chance again because we obviously didn't want to lose another child. We were told Bella had 18 months um, with us. And so we thought, okay, well, you know, we, we need to do what we can to have a healthy child. So we did what we could to um, learn about IVF, genetic testing, um, what's the probability of us having success. Um, I had Bella when I was 37. Um, so I you know, I wanted that year of breast milk for her. So um, at 38, I did my first retrieval and we wound up getting five healthy embryos from that. Um, we did two transfers and they both didn't work out. Um, so we thought, okay, well, we initially wanted three children. So we had Bella, but we kind of thought, okay, well, maybe we should try to have three more. And at that point, then we had three embryos left. So we said, okay, well, let's do another retrieval while I'm still young. <laughs> um, so we did another retrieval. And of that one, I only, I got two healthy embryos. So total, we had seven. The two losses at first. And then um, the third try was Lily. And um, again, wanted to wait a year um, before having, trying again. Uh, with our other embryos and pretty much since then there were delays there was covid um 
I had some other issues that like with fibroids that had to be removed. I had to have surgery. Um, so the process got so drawn out that for the seven embryos to be transferred, I finally did my last transfer um, in 2022. Um, so they all four of those then um, did, did not work. So of the seven embryos, we had one successful pregnancy. Um, and I was told that I had about a 60% success rate. I did not, from what I knew, had have fertility issues at all. I went through so many different tests and there was nothing abnormal. Everything was, was normal, they said. So um, I'm not sure what happened, um, but it, it certainly didn't work out as we planned. Um, and so a last resort sort of now, um, I mean, I'm older, of course, and we're now going through IUI, um, which is, again, kind of a risk. So then you kind of think, okay, why we should have done this before. Why did we even go through IVF? Because we, we did this, like, safety, you know, route with IVF and genetic testing, and now here we are doing IUIs. Um, and so, you know, we have that um, ethical kind of challenge um, there of what's going to happen if I were to get pregnant and then the baby was affected. Um, so these are, they're just kind of the, the challenges that we have um, now that we're kind of taking that last step. Um, but it would, it would be a miracle <laughs> if it happened. Um, and so I'm hoping, you know, keep have faith that maybe there's one healthy one in there for me. But um, it, it has been a very long journey. Um, a lot of ups and downs, lots and lots of sorrow, unfortunately, more than, well, more than success, I guess. But then when that one does actually work out for you, then it's worth every penny. It's worth every tear um, just to have that, that feeling, you know, that child that you, um, you know, that was sort of so hard to, <laughs> to have. And I appreciate her and Bella so much more because it's not easy, um, but I'm, I'm obviously very glad that I have the two of them, and um, we'll see what happens in the future if we can we can grow the family. But um, it is a it's a hard decision to make. Yeah, and I imagine. Um you know, you invest so much time and you, you know, reproduction is one of those things that I think we all take for granted when you're younger and you just assume it's going to happen when you're older. And so whether it happens because, um, you know, from the beginning you find out you have fertility issues or whether it's when you're in the midst of it and you're finding this out, it, it can really rock that foundation. So kind of that foundational thought. Um, so Al, um, you had some experience um, with the same type of technology before, but eventually decided to adopt. Um, and you mentioned um, your experience at NIH. So can you just share with that a little bit? You've had quite a journey to get to, to yeah, where so, you ended yeah, up. Yeah, the session is, is stirring up some <laughs> vivid memories from those years and what we experienced it was um it was pretty crazy um and it was i'd say it was like being in a tv show and we actually were um after jack was diagnosed <clears throat> i we didn't know what to do and the internet was brand new and i searched on the internet with one of those old phone connections and i found that a doctor at nih was studying spinal muscular atrophy and I reached out to him by email and told him our story. And he invited us to come down here to meet with him. And he met uh, Jack and Jack's mom and I. And he um, offered to have us be the first family to have pre-implantation genetic diagnosis with an IVF for SMA. And they took Jack's blood and they took our blood um, to design the, the test, uh, the screening test for the IVF. And the doctor said to us that this was so new that he wasn't sure that it would work for us. But if it didn't work for us, if we didn't have a healthy baby using this technology, another family would. 
And we were grateful just to know that Jack could help in that way at that time. Um, once we were signed up with NIH, I actually did get a phone call from the Discovery Channel who were doing a documentary series called Making Babies. I'm just remembering the title. And one of the episodes was on this new technology called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So we had a, a, a really nice guy with a camera, a film camera following us around for two weeks and learning about Jack and learning about this process and followed us down here to NIH when we did the, the IVF. <clears throat> um, when we came down to do the IVF, um, we, we, we ended up with one healthy embryo and it, it didn't take, it wasn't enough, uh, not enough embryos, but while we were here at NIH, Jack got sick for the first time. He was maybe two years old and he aspirated a bottle. He was drinking out of the bottle of milk. He aspirated and we end up in the intensive care unit, Fairfax Hospital down here. And I'll never forget Jack with a breathing mask on his face and wondering if he would live through this first illness. And his mom needed fertility injections after getting the uh, process done and I had to get special permission from the hospital for the nurse to give mom fertility injections and she had to have her feet up in the air while laying next to Jack who had a mask on his face and the Discovery Channel guy was in there with the camera. <clears throat> and I thought to myself, this is my, our lives really are a TV show. We, <clears throat> we, agreed, we agreed to have the participation in the Discovery Channel because they promised us that they would uh, put the website, which is brand new, the internet was new, for the, the Cure SMA, uh, our rare disease advocacy group, because we felt strongly we wanted people to know what SMA was. So we made a deal. If you, if you tell everybody about SMA, we'll let you film our crazy life. Um, and, and we were the subject of a half-hour documentary all those years ago. Um, when the technology didn't, the process didn't work for us, it did work for other families, and in, in subsequent years, the, the SMA conferences I had the privilege of meeting a number of families and babies who were healthy and born without SMA. Um, by rem they, they would take an eight-cell embryo and um, remove a cell and examine it for SMA, and they were able to tell if that embryo was affected or not affected. Uh, the researcher, by the way, without going into politics, lost his funding because the Congress changed at the time and uh, the funding was removed because of the discarding of embryos. So there was a political dimension to this at the time as well. Um, uh, we turned our attention to having a child a, a different way and that led me to a, an adoption agency in Korea. And uh, I'll never forget the 50-page form that said, do not call me in 18 different places, just fill out the form. But I called her. I said, I know I'm not supposed to call, but I want you to hear the story before I fill out your 50-page form. And I told her about Jack, and I told her about our situation, that we'd likely lose Jack, and I wondered if they would accept us um, and place a baby with us, given the unusual nature of our family and what the baby would endure. Um, and I'm, I'm still grateful to Cecilia, the woman from Korea. We chose Korea, by the way, because they brought babies to the United States. We wouldn't have to travel and leave Jack behind. Cecilia heard the story and she said, Al, let me tell you something. If you can take care of that boy, you can take care of one of my babies. And uh, that's that, what that led to uh, our adopting our baby Kara, who had arrived in the year 2000 from Korea as a four-month-old infant. And uh, she is now, as I mentioned this morning, 23 years old and working full-time here at NORD uh, in the patient uh, registry department. I'm very proud of her. Um, and she was not a consolation prize. You know, it, uh, adoption is a complicated thing, but uh, what a gift to our family. Um, a social worker told me that we should try to expand our family. It helps divide our attention to have a healthy child. Um, alongside of Jack, divided our attention, and she was a gift and a great sister to Jack uh, and, a, and a wonderful young person who has a uh, uh, great sensitivity and compassion and humility, having grown up with a brother like Jack. I'm very proud of her. Um, so that I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> no, it did, and, and more, um, in, in a good way, in a very good way. Um, 
the experience of siblings is something we'll, we'll touch on um, if we have time a little bit later, but I think that was a, some great insight on that. Um, so Tiana, now you mentioned that your decision to um, have bone marrow transplant um, really thrusted you into thinking about your fertility and kind of the plans that you had before that and, and now. So can you just explain a little bit what it felt like to have to reconcile this potential cure um, with your chant, you know, your plans and, and desires to have biological children? Yeah, you know, um, it was really tough because... I mean, obviously hindsight is twenty twenty, but at the time, um, being 19, I'm thinking like, if I kept having the complications from sickle cell, I might die and not get the chance to be a mother at all. Like I might not even get to adopt. And so um, it was a really tough decision. And as I kind of evolved and got older, it didn't feel right that it had to be a choice. Like it shouldn't have to be fertility or a cure. Um, and like I was saying, when I was looking into resources, there was a long list of foundations and even policy that if you had a diagnosis of cancer, you could access fertility services. But for me, I couldn't. And I was like, why is it such a huge disparity? Why do we have to choose when there are other populations that have the option of both a cure and fertility? And, um, you know, I feel like I've made peace with it now, but it's been really hard because I rejected. And in my mind, I was not going to reject that transplant. So, again, it would have been an okay trade-off to live my life sickle cell free. But I did reject. And so that was something that was really hard because I felt like I did it myself. Like, that was a choice that I made to go for that transplant. And ultimately, I'm infertile, which was the thing that I feared the most. So... It was really tough, and um, you know, I think that I've found a lot of healing and empowerment through starting my organization and trying to make sure nobody else has to go through this. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm a I'm a bounce it right back to you. So as you've you know taken this path and this journey and started SC Reg your organization. Um, what have you heard from the community at large and issues around access to these types of options? Yeah, so it's the same thing. Um, now there's data that disease progression, some of our treatments can impact fertility. And so there's a lot of people in the community dealing with this. And um, ultimately, I was going to just have a foundation that gave away grants for fertility. But what I realized was that you can't address fertility in sickle cell without addressing things like delayed puberty or lack of access to care for therapies for pregnant women and no data on contraceptive options that don't increase our, our risk for stroke. So that's how we expanded. And um, we do more than fertility. We do reproductive, sexual, and maternal health. And even just dealing with family planning, um, having a genetic condition and deciding, do I want to, if like, if I have sickle cell and my partner has trait, are we going to have babies? And there's a misconception in the um, sickle cell community too, that if I have sickle cell, maybe I can't even get pregnant. And um, recently my co-founder put out data that the maternal mortality rate for women with sickle cell is 26 times higher than the national average. So there's fear in even knowing if you can get pregnant, um, Sickle cell disease, you know, a lot of times people see it as a disease of pain, but ultimately it's a disease of shortened lifespan. So I hear a lot of people who are like, they don't even want kids because what if they have them, they die and that trauma and all of that. So it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that support is needed in allowing people to know that they're not alone in that. Um, so Al talked a bit about... Um, the experience of his daughter and the great things, of course, she's doing as a, you know, probably direct effect of of Jack being there um, in her life. Um, but that that can be a concern. What is if I have a, a, another child? What is the effect going to be? And so, Beth, can you talk a little bit about maybe the conversations you had within your family as you thought about you know having more children and and how that might have influenced the decision she made. Sure, so um, I think initially you have to think of 
like the subjective type things like, okay, I'm creating embryos here. Um, ethically, do I agree with this? Am I okay with this? Am I okay that the affected ones are going to um, be, I mean, I guess you can donate them to science, but, um, you know, they'll be, they will be um, removed and they'll be destroyed, essentially. Um, you need to decide if you want to try naturally and take that chance? Do you want to take that 25% chance of having an, a child, you know, with the same condition? Um, and then in my case, I was also getting older, so the chromosomal abnormalities were, you know, are higher risk. So it wasn't for me only Bella's condition, but it was like, you know, my, my eggs were, <laughs> were changing on me, so they weren't as um, good quality. So it was like, okay, we could try this naturally because it seemed like we could um, physically do it, but, you know, like, did we really want to take that risk? Um, and then we kind of thought about what are the success rates. We did as much research as we could, talked to the doctors. Um, and then there's other things more objective, like, you know, can we afford this? Because there's IVF, but then there's also genetic testing, and that is extremely expensive. Um, luckily, my husband was in the military, and um, Walter Reed has an IVF program that has reduced costs. So that was a huge benefit for us. Um, but so obviously, like, cost is an issue. Um, it is a lot of time. And especially if you have to travel, um, if it's far away um, from your house, you know, there's a lot of appointments, there's a lot of monitoring. Um, you know, you have to remember your medicine at certain times. I mean, it, of course, it's all worth it. It's just, you have, like, these are just things to consider. Um, and, I, like, we had to consider my age. Um, the stress, the stress that it was going to place on our family. How could we do this with Bella? Could we do this with Bella? Um, who was going to stay with her when, you know, Bill had to come with me? Or, you know, just like, like logistically, because Bella needs 24-7 care. And, you know, we can't leave her with anybody. I can't, like, call up my neighbor and say, hey, come and stay with Bella. Um, there's very few people who I would trust to stay with her and take good care of her. So, um, so I guess just then we thought, okay, well, this, we, we want to grow our family. We're going to take this step and we're going to move forward, um, and do the IVF. Um, so then quickly, the other consideration is like having Bella, how would, Be how would Lily's life, what would her life look like? And there, um, there's, you know, I think Lily, like Al said, Lily has a lot of empathy at age four. Um, she's extremely helpful. I think she's very patient for her age um, because sometimes, like, I kind of joke with her. It's not really funny, but she'll be like, Mommy, I'm hungry. And I'm like, okay, well, I need to suction Bella. So I'll be like, breathing or food? Breathing or food? And, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I got to take care of the breathing first, and then I'll give you food. So, you know, bad joke maybe, but it's kind of you know, kind of funny in our household, I guess. Um, but, um, so, it, consider that, like, I feel guilty a lot. I feel like Lily misses out on certain things. It's a beautiful day outside. If I'm the only one home, I can't go outside with her. I can't just say, let's go out and play. Let's go draw with the chalk. I can't, I, I can't leave. Um, I can't hop in the car and be like, let's go to the playground, because it's hard to put Bella in the car. It takes half an hour, you know, like it's just not fun. And so I feel like, I feel guilty a lot. Like Lily's missing out on life and it's just how it is. And I, I mean, ultimately I, I think she's going to be fine and she's going to be healthy and happy. But it, as a mom who you want to give everything to your kids, it's, you know, it's really hard. It's hard to see her like mommy let's go outside let's go outside and it's like 70 degrees and sunny and I'm like oh, I can't Lily I can't and but in the end um I think 
her character and her person is going to be extra unique. Um, and I think she has a special bond with Bella that even at age four, like I can tell she helps her like draw and she helps her um, like move her hand sometimes and she'll put stuffed animals on her lap and like she'll sit with her and Bella has an eye gaze machine and Lily kind of like goes and plays with her with it. And um, Bella is just, I know Bella and her, it's like Bella's way of her face lighting up. So, I mean, the, um, it's not to like discourage anyone, but just to consider these things. So, you know, what kind of like what might go through your mind, but also know that it's completely worth it. And I wouldn't not discourage you from it, but just to like prepare yourself um, for some of those feelings you might have. No, I appreciate that real talk, <laughs> right? It's it's um, it's needed, and that's why we're we're having this conversation. And so, Al, you know, we know that you're a psychologist, and you have uh, really focused a good part of your work on helping families. Um, you know, even like Beth, like your own, um, who have these uncommon medical challenges. So. How has your journey helped with being able to relate to your clients? And kind of what other insights or thoughts do you have, advice or, <laughs> or thoughts um, in that area? Well, first, the answer to the first question is um, my son and my journey personally has um, profoundly affected the trajectory of my professional work. And it's not, I'm not sitting here because I have a PhD in psychology. A lot of people have a PhD in psychology. I'm sitting here because of my experience with my children as a father. And the PhD in psychology comes in handy while I'm counseling families. But I feel credible in my work. And the groups I facilitate online and the clients that I work with feel that I understand them because I've lived this experience. So I've been profoundly uh, affected. Um, as, by my experience. Um, I, I'm remembering being on an elevator in the hospital when Jack was there at Christmas, the intensive care unit, and um, I ran into a member of the clergy visiting a patient, and uh, he asked me if I was a member of the clergy, and I said, no, I'm, I'm a dad. My son is in the same unit you're going to visit, and I showed him a picture of, of Jack, and he paused, and he said, he says, aha, he said, uh, uh, your son is the minister, you, you are his messenger. Uh, that stuck with me. So I feel like um, Jack's still here, I'm still uh, his messenger. Um, with the families that are facing these types of challenges, and yes, all the feelings, I work with a lot of families whose moms feel just the way you do, and I did too about my daughter. It's very common. Um, <clears throat> we have we have a family, we have a different kind of family, a different kind of journey. Um, and our Families, the families I work with are creative and they're adaptive and they're determined um, because we have to be to face these types of uh, complicated um, situations. And our siblings are profoundly affected by the experience. Um, there are challenges, yes, but there are also some special gifts that our siblings receive by being uh, with their siblings and being part of the family that um, you, you you can't buy for money. Again, with the rare disease comes some rare gifts as well. And the last point I'd make is that uh, as a parent um, and as a patient, um, what I find in my work is you, you can handle more than you think you can handle. Um, if someone had told me before Jack's diagnosis what was going to happen, I would have said, I, w I would have said, lock me up in a rubber room. I won't be able to deal with that. And... Uh, I think I'm surprised at how much I was able and still am uh, able to deal with in a positive way. And we all have more strength and resilience than we think we have. Um, people come to me and say, oh, oh, you're the greatest dad. You you did all this for Jack. How did you do it? You're like superhero. And I say, no, no, you, you give your children what they need and I give, gave my son what he needed he just needed something different than most, but you would, you give your child what your child needs too, you know. So we all do what we need to do, um, and we give our kids what what they need. Um, we surprise ourselves with what we can do. Um, I hope I hope that helps and boil it down to a few seconds of of a career of right. this work. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think we need to take a question from the audience. 
Yes, and I just want to say this has been an incredibly powerful session. Thank you so much for the wisdom uh, and, and the thoughtfulness you've shared. Uh, we have received actually several questions, but unfortunately we're only going to have time for one. Uh, and that question is, if I want to talk to a genetic counselor about my family planning options, does insurance usually cover this? And is there a way for me to get it covered if it's not? So I guess I'll take that one as the genetic counselor, <laughs> um, which I don't think I even revealed to everyone. So I am a genetic counselor. Um, and I'm happy to report that the vast majority of insurances actually do cover genetic counseling. Um, it's a service that you can be referred for um, by your provider. Um, probably the bigger issue is potentially is finding a genetic counselor because there's not a lot of us. Um, it's about five or 6,000 in the United States, but we're really aggregated around university medical centers, you know, urban areas. So that has certainly been an issue within our field. Um, that being said, there are some telegenetic services um, and you can self-refer um, if you go to the National Society of Genetic Counselors. Um, website, there's a find a genetic counselor tool that's there. So that's where I would point that person to, um, to find those services. And we certainly can discuss these different options. This has been a fabulous panel, and thank you to all of you.